Hello, and welcome to this very special video series from HR Magazine. My name is Katie Jacobs, and I am the editor of HR Magazine. And this year, to celebrate our 25th anniversary, we are pleased to present a series of video interviews with Dave Ulrich on the future of the HR profession. Ulrich is the father of the HR business partner model and is consistently voted one of the most influential thinkers in HR. In this video, kindly sponsored by Midland HR, Ulrich discusses how HR can manage the perspective of multiple stakeholders. So what we want to do today is to reflect on the future of HR. Where is the function going? How should it develop? I think we've come a really long way. It's time to move on from talking about having a seat at the table. HR has that seat at the table now. The question is, what value and information can the function bring to businesses? So Dave, it's now 20 years or almost 20 years since the publication of your seminal work, HR Champion, and your latest book, The Leadership Capital Index is really taking um, an interesting view on HR because it's really looking at a group of people that we haven't really thought of before when we talk about people management, which is the investor community. So I guess what I'd like to ask you first is quite a broad question. Where would you like to see HR going in the next 10 years? Great question. I was asked recently, um, how do you describe what you do for a living? And uh, my kids have crazy answers, which I won't share with you because that would embarrass me and them. But here's my metaphor, elephants, eat grass. They process grass and then they pass grass. Most of the people in the academic world study the grass that's been passed. Now I said that to a group of academics once and they said, are you really telling us that's what we study? And I said, I am, wear gloves. <laughs> um, my passion is to plant the grass that will be eaten next year. How do we think about the next? How do we go forward in HR? And when I think about HR, I love to think about the future in three things. And I'm going to use a flip chart because I think as a professor, it's what I love to do. So when I think about HR future, there's three things that come to mind. And it stands for pot. Now I know that pot has many meetings. And, and, and Katie, when I looked at you, you started, you started to smoke and, and smoke was coming out. But the first is our perspective. The perspective means we begin to think about HR not about what we do, but from the outside in. Outside in says HR is not about HR, it's about the value HR creates for stakeholders, including investors. And so it's not about what I do in HR, it's about who gets stuff. The second is outcomes. I love your concept. We have a seat at the table. In fact, if an HR person doesn't have a seat at the table, I almost argue they should get out of our field because they should be there. What do they deliver when they're there? And we've talked about three things, talent, leadership, and culture. So HR comes to that table and has outcomes. And the third, the T, is how do we then transform HR? And that gets into the HR structure, the roles that we play and how we work together. It also gets into the HR competencies and it gets into the HR analytics. So when I think about HR going forward, I think about perspective, outcomes, and transformation. Fantastic. Three buckets of where we mm. should be headed. Great. So if we could go through each of those buckets and take quite a deep dive into them. So let's start with perspective. And I think the interesting thing here is one phrase I've been hearing quite a lot is kind of multi-stakeholder yep. HR. So you're not just delivering even for your business anymore. That's not enough. How yep. are you delivering to your, your internal customers, your external customers, the investment community, like the wider like society at large. Yeah. And I think that is a huge challenge huge for a traditionally quite inward focused function. Yeah. So. One of the questions we love to ask people, and it's one of the questions I, two questions, we say to people, tell me the biggest challenge in your job today. Often I hear HR people saying, well, the biggest challenge is getting the staffing system right. The biggest challenge is managing training. The biggest challenge is compensation. Wrong. The biggest challenge we face in HR is helping our business succeed. Mm. That could be public sector, could be private sector, could be big, could be small. But the perspective is not what we do, it's what somebody gets from what we do. And so we call that kind of an outside-in perspective, and there's two pieces of that. One is general business conditions. The world is changing quickly. So what do we have to do inside? We have to build agility. We have to build flexibility. Can we respond? And the second is what you alluded to so nicely, 
our stakeholders. How do we in HR respond to stakeholders inside the company and outside the company? A second question I love to ask HR people, who's your customer? Mm -hmm. I still hear 80, not 80, 70 to 80 percent of the time, our customer in HR are the employees. Wrong. The customer of HR is the customer of the business. If the customer of the business doesn't, add, doesn't buy products or services or use the services, there are no employees. How do we get HR from inside the company to outside? And those two agendas begin to create what we call an outside-in approach. We then begin to connect what we do in HR outside. Mm -hmm. You alluded to one, the investor. Mm -hmm. Are we doing HR work so that an investor in my company has more confidence in my future? That for me changes the question of HR and it creates value from what we do. Mm. And I think over here in the UK and I think in America as well, there is an increased appetite from the investor community to actually consider what are those metrics that demonstrate success outside of the financial. So we're looking for measurements that suggest that a business is going to be successful, not just in six months, not in a year, in three years, five years, 10 years. Absolutely. I think a lot of those do come down to people. But I think a lot of HR, a lot of the HR community perhaps think that shareholder investment, shareholder value and the people agenda just cannot work together. Right. In, in fact, sometimes people say, oh, are you focused on people? Are you focused on shareholders? And the answer is yes. Mm. In fact, what we've seen in the shareholder world as an investor is we've seen there's three things investors look at. One is financial performance. Does your company meet its goals? Mm. And, the, and the investor could be debt or it could be equity. Second is what's called intangibles. Do you have a strategy, a brand, you have R&D? And the third is quality of leadership or human capital. It's that third one that's starting to get attention. Mm -hmm. Here's some of the stuff we've been doing that just for me is so fascinating because I'm honest, I don't have a good answer for this. We go to investors and we say, divide 100 points when you invest in a company long term. Do you invest in their profits, their intangibles, or their leadership? What we've gotten is 35 to 40 percent in financials, 30 to 35 percent in intangibles, and about 30 percent in leadership. So investors say leadership matters. Mm. We all know that. So zero to 10. How well can you assess each of those? Financials, nine out of 10. Mm. Earnings, we get our degrees, we get our analytics. Intangibles, seven or eight out of 10. Leadership, three out of 10. So we began to put together, and I think the time is right, the disciplines of leadership that investors can look at. Mm -hmm. Now for HR folks, this is a great opportunity because we're doing leadership investment, not simply to get leaders to be more authentic. We're doing leadership investment so that investors will pay us a premium mm -hmm. for the future, either lowering the cost of capital for debt or increasing the market value of the firm. Why do you think the time is right for this? Because I agree with you and it does feel that it's almost reached a critical mass of people outside of HR being interested in these issues and I assume it's probably due to the shockwave still being felt after the global financial crisis. I think there's two drivers and, and you're right. One is the investor. The investors are asking a very simple question. How can I make money for my investors? Do you own stock in any companies? No, you don't own stock. <laughs> Would you like to own stock in companies? And if you own stock in a company, what do you want? You want the stock to go up. Yeah. Here's the problem, financial and intangibles, it's called information symmetry. All investors have the same data. Mm. And if you have the same data, you're not gonna make a better investment. They're trying to find information asymmetry about leadership. So investors are saying, what can I do that gives me an advantage? Have you ever placed a bet on a sports team? A place of like on the Grand National. <laughs> what, if had what if you had information that, had information that nobody, else, that nobody had else had about injury or about leadership mm -hmm. or about, would you use that to make a better bet? Yes, of course. Of course you would. You're greedy. That's called good <laughs> HR people. <laughs> Intelligent. Well, that's investors. Mm -hmm. And for them, the leadership is a source of information nobody else has yet. Mm -hmm. For the leadership folks, we have done so many thousands of studies of leadership. Mm -hmm. We know what good leadership looks like. We haven't yet put it in investor terms. So the investor wants unique information. We have information. And that combination, I think, is, is what we call the leadership capital index. Mm -hmm. It's realizing the market value of leadership. So HR's got a pretty vital role to play there. What kind of steps do you think they need to take as a function? I think we're going to see in the next couple of years 
almost every company does a report to their investors, their stockholders or their debt holders, or if government to the legislators. And in that one hour meeting, they talk about their financial performance, their strategy, their brand. I believe we're going to have 10 to 20 percent of that meeting on leadership. Mm. And who should be framing that discussion? HR. Mm. We should come to those meetings and have in, uh, informed discussions with investors about what leadership our company has, for better or for worse. Mm. That's for me a great opportunity for HR. So when we're sitting at that table yeah. that you described so mm. well, what is it we say? Ooh, be authentic. <laughs> you know. In America, and I'll, I'll date this, sometimes we have politicians running for office, this would never happen in the UK, who are very authentic, mm. but not particularly good leaders. Mm. So they're honest, they're candid, and they're stupid. Sometimes you need to have authenticity mm. that moves to investor con confidence. Yeah. And that's what we want HR folks to help provide. Mm. How do you equip yourself to have that kind of conversation? Great question. In the research we've done for 25 years on HR competencies, one of the competencies has been called knowing the business. Mm. And it's not just business literacy, finance, marketing, economics. It's now called strategic positioner. So it's we know the business as HR people well enough that we can position the business in the marketplace we serve. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a couple of the other stakeholders, the kind of what's HR's role in dealing with customers, those external customers, and also I think you can extend that to think about communities. Super. Pick an HR uh, area. It could be staffing, could be training, could be leadership, could be culture. Just pick an area. Oh, talent. Talent. Here's the line for talent. We want to be the employer of choice. Mm -hmm. You've heard that. I've yes. heard that. I probably, I probably stole it and have quoted it without giving attribution yes. to people who came up with it. Today I think it's incomplete. Mm. We want to be the employer of choice of employees our customers would choose. Mm -hmm. If we don't have a standard of hiring and training and developing our people in ways that add value to our customers, we're doing the wrong thing. It's so obvious. But go back into the HR companies. When we do hiring, when we do promotions, when we do training, are we doing those with customers in mind? And are we doing the things that will help customers buy more from us? Mm -hmm. That's an example. You could do the same with leadership. You could do the same with culture. Yeah. That our HR world changes when we put the customer in view. The same applies to communities. We've been doing work with mineral rights holders, okay. oil companies, yeah. mining companies. Before they can go do the mineral rights work, digging and, and accessing the minerals, they have to build a relationship with the community. In fact, in a couple of places in Latin America, some of the large mineral rights companies have had a five to six year window working with the local community people, moving people, managing the tribes, managing the government who has access to the rights. Guess who's run that? HR. Mm. Because HR people seem to have a knack at forming relationships. Mm. And so with communities, with customers, with investors, with partners, HR begins to build a connection to the business in a dramatic way. 